So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Several of you in the last few weeks have asked me if I will share some ideas on the topic of loss. I don't sermonize. I hope most of you realize that by now. I don't give addresses, and I quit lecturing quite some time ago. So I share ideas. I throw ideas out for what they're worth. And you can take these and work with them if you wish. So I want to share some ideas. It's a huge subject. It's not only a huge subject for many people, it's a very disturbing subject as well. Because loss is very much a part of our day-to-day -day lives. I think if you look at the issue of loss, you probably can divide it up into several categories. We have the loss of things, of objects, that we've treasured, artifacts possibly, that have been taken from us or lost. Then of course we, we do have the loss of certain qualities, a youth, we live in a, a youth-oriented society, after all. But I think the loss that troubles us, perhaps most of all, or which concerns us most of all, is the loss of a friend or a loved one who seems to have passed from our sight. Let me begin, first of all, with talking about the loss of objects. It is unfortunate in our culture, in our society, that we have tended to make of people objects. We have tended to fit people into our agendas as objects rather than as independent living expressions of God. And that's one of the reasons we often feel the sense of loss so keenly when we lose them. Let me move first, however, to the loss of things that we love, objects that we may have had taken from us. If we had gone back today a thousand years to, say, medieval Europe, we would have been surprised to discover that people weren't so obsessed with objects as we are today. They did not live in a materialistic society. I can't tell you that their society was any happier or better than ours today. But certainly, if you had spoken of our love of objects and our frantic desire to accumulate them, they would have been somewhat surprised in most instances. It is true that they loved beautiful things. They were esthetes, some of them. They collected beautiful objects. But as far as the kinds of things that we surround ourselves with today, the cars that we have to insure at huge expense that sometimes get bashed, well, this would have been a mystery to them. Their eyes were centered on something different, something other, something transcendent. We live in a, an age in which a huge amount of attention is paid to what we have about us in the material sense. There's nothing necessarily wrong in that. Don't misunderstand me. It only means that when we lose such objects, we feel perhaps an acute sense of loss. I told the story early this morning of a grandmother of mine. I had two formidable grandmothers. Both of them lived to be nearly a hundred. And gee, they were tough cookies, I can tell you that right now. Wonderful women, but very tough. One of them had had a fire in her home before I was born. I had nothing to do with it, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, she'd had to move all her antique furniture, so-called, out onto the front patio or the yard. And she had to go away for 48 hours to stay with some relatives so some of the damage could be fixed. Unfortunately, during that period of time, during the time that she went away to stay with the relatives, guess what happened? A moving van arrived and all her precious antiques were loaded aboard and taken off to a destination regrettably unknown. In other words, they were stolen by some enterprising thieves. 
It is true that some of the neighbors observed this terrible abduction, but they said nothing because they thought that my grandmother had ordered it to occur. When she discovered her world fell apart, for the rest of her life, which as I have suggested already, was of considerable duration, <laughs> we heard as a family nothing but grandma's loss. Oh dear, oh dear, if you went to see beloved grandma, within the first 10 minutes, the loss would crop up. The loss. It was as though her right arm had been removed under duress because this furniture, she called it antique, to be honest with you, as they say in Ireland, uh, I have to say that um, it was really not as antique as she would have liked to imagine. In fact, she was still complaining about it when she was an antique, and it was not. <laughs> but I saw there at first hand the impact of loss physical loss of something that meant a great deal, that gave her an identity, in fact. That furniture was her identity. She'd come from extreme poverty, and that furniture was her identity. It was her. It was her, and it had been taken. And we lived with the story of that for the rest of her life. Now, years later, when I was in California, uh, which way is that? Um, well, to some people, it might be... Um, I was in Malibu some years ago and I, I developed a friendship with a very interesting man. He held uh, numerous franchises, not in basketball, I hasten to say. <laughs> he was a very wealthy man and he had a, a beautiful home there in Malibu, a home that had been built, built, I believe, by one of the early silent film stars, Mary Pickford, something like that. And he had this home filled with beautiful objets d'art. I didn't agree altogether with his taste. I thought some of it was a little, well, we won't go there, but um, uh, he had beautiful things around him. Now, he suffered a business reverse several years after I had first met him. And the next time I caught up with him, he was living in Florida. And he was living in a one-room condominium. And he had nothing around him, really. Absolutely nothing. A few bits and sticks that looked as though they'd come from the Salvation Army. And I asked him, I said, how do you feel about the loss of all those wonderful things that you had? And he said, I don't feel a sense of loss because I know that while I had those things in my possession, while I had them about me, while I might dispose of them as I wished, I was nevertheless only a steward for that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And when it went, I let it go. That's fine. Because he said, I remember what scripture says, that naked I came into the world, and naked I shall surely leave it. It reminds me of the story, as I suggested earlier to some of the folks, that I read in the New York Times that wicked newspaper of a family who had succeeded in getting an injunction to open their grandfather's burial vault. Why did they want to open the vault? Because their grandfather had decided that he wanted to take his 1915 Cadillac with him. Well, in the intervening years, 1950, 15 Cadillacs had assumed a considerable value. I don't know what they did with the poor old boy who was in the, in the vault, but certainly they managed to get the Cadillac out. A possession, a possession. It was of more value to them, obviously, than he was. So I think that we have to have a sense of perspective. We have to realize that whatever things we may have, sometimes beautiful things, things given us, things bequeathed us, things bought by us, we are nevertheless no more than stewards for some of these beautiful objects. They are not things that we can take with us. We should not invest them with too much significance. Because if we do lose them, if they are taken from us, should we, should we for some reason or another dispose of them? 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect who we are. We are not the objects that we own, but too often they tend to own us. Let me move on to the loss of life, so-called, and the loss of a loved one or a friend. I love what the Apostle Paul, he's an apostle in his estimation at least, the Apostle Paul said to his friends, the Philippians, he said, all I can say is this, forgetting what is behind me and reaching out for that which lies ahead, I press towards the goal to win the prize which is God's call to the life eternal. He had no doubt that eternal life lay before him. What justification had he? Because when we talk about somebody losing their lives, what do we mean? Do we really think about what we're saying when we utter such words? In order to help us understand, I want to take you back not quite 2,500 years, but almost, to ancient Greece and to a man called Plato. Now, probably some of you or all of you have heard of Plato. There was a great triad of Greek philosophers who lived at that time, and many more, incidentally, not so famous. Socrates, who gave his life for the truth and the right to speak his word. Plato and Aristotle, who was, in fact, the tutor of Alexander the Great. Plato and Aristotle have had huge influence, even into modern times. Plato, I want to suggest to you this morning, was one of the great mystics of all time. We don't know what his name was. Plato means Platon in the Demotic Greek of the time. It means the broad-shouldered one. He was obviously a broad-shouldered man. Stocky, broad-shouldered man. We don't know his real name. Plato, Platon. Plato as he looked around, saw that somehow the universe was a created entity and that all things in it were expressions of ideas that that creative entity must have. That was a supreme and significant and most extraordinary breakthrough and development in human consciousness, which has indeed, as I say, influenced thought for the past two and a half millennia. He was not interested in the Judean God, Jehovah, had he even known about Jehovah, he wouldn't have been interested because he was a Greek and Greeks were very proud of their intellectual as well as their sovereign independence. But Plato had this magnificent notion that God was in effect mind and that in this mind there were forms and these forms were made manifest in created, in created existence. Fascinating. Move forward those 25 or 2300 years to the founders of our own movement, unity. We have a trinity in unity. Did you know that? Did you know that we have a trinity? Yes, we do. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? No. Mind, idea, and expression. This is what the Fillmore's called our trinity. Mind, is there a mind without ideas? I've met one or two. <laughs> Generally not. Minds have in them ideas. And ideas demand expression. Mind, idea, and expression. It's Plato's, Plato's formula for existence. Eternal existence. And that's what we in unity believe that we are, folks. We are, as it were, an unique divine blueprint, each one of us. We have a necessary existence. We can't not be. We are. We is. And we shall is. Because we must is. <laughs> Let's distort what is already a distorted grammar. This is the wonder of our existence. Nobody is lost. To speak of losing someone is not only a non sequitur, it's a silly thing to say because it's not true. Everybody 
moves on, passes through another phase of existence. This, I believe, this many, many great thinkers have believed throughout those 2,500 years since Plato first saw that wonderful vision. And we in unity teach it. We may believe that those whom we lose are lost to us because we cannot see them. But we all know in our hearts that because we cannot see something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Our loved ones move on. We shall move on. We, ideas in the mind of God, unique ideas, shall not perish because we cannot perish. We cannot dismiss somebody to non-being. It's not possible. We are called upon to be patient, understanding, but never to say somebody is lost to us. That's not true. There can be no loss because the transformation and the transformations go on and on. It's hard sometimes to appreciate this, but it's one of the great spiritual lessons, perhaps the greatest spiritual lesson that we have to learn and to appreciate, to understand and ourselves to express, that you can't do away with life. However much you may try, life goes on in a myriad forms and expressions. Mind, idea, expression, always expression, never loss. So the whole idea of loss is, is itself not to be born. We cannot lose. We are stewards for a season. We enjoy for a period. We see somebody pass from our sight. Is this loss? Is this loss? No, it's not loss. Of course not loss. It is in most instances merely transformation. And when we are strengthened in this realization, when we hold it in our hearts, when we feel it, when we feel it deeply in our being, our lives are transformed. And we see how all of us are eternally one with all that is. And there can never truly be loss unless unless we want there to be. I'm finished.